Jesus has just revealed that he is a different Messiah than what most people expected. He certainly shocked Peter. After teaching Peter about being a suffering Messiah, we now have an early peek at the resurrection glory. We read from Mark chapter 7. Six days later, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and brought them to the top of a very high mountain where they were alone. He was transformed in front of them, and his clothes were amazingly bright, brighter than if they had been bleached white. Elijah and Moses appeared, and they were talking with Jesus. Peter reacted to all this by saying to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good that we're here. Let's, let's make three shrines, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. He said this because he didn't know how to respond, for the three of them were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice spoke from the cloud. This is my son, whom I dearly love. Listen to him. Suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. Here ends the reading. Through these words, guide us to live a spirit-filled life. Let us pray. O oh God, out of all the words which are spoken this day, out of all the words which are sung, out of all the words which are heard, may it be Your living Word that abides with us. Your living Word that sticks with us and gives us life. And let all God's children say, Amen. I think we've got some microphone interference um, perhaps from the mic that, the, that uh, uh, was taken for the children's time. All right, we'll do our best here. John, do you suggest that I use a, a different mic? All right, very good. Yeah, we're hearing a bit of thunder almost, so... We'll try this, see if this is any better. I've always enjoyed mountains. I've always enjoyed mountain tops. Driving to the Canadian Rockies and whitewater rafting in the Colorado Rockies. Visiting my brother Paul in Asheville, North Carolina. Touring the Bavarian Alps with our son Colin where he lives a little north from there in Berlin. And I've been on the mountain, Mount Tabor, in Israel, where, at least according to tradition, this vision before us in our Scripture today took place of Jesus and Moses and Elijah. I've been to Mount Tabor there. And it seems to me that we all need mountaintops in some way in our lives to have a place to just stand in the awe-filled presence of God. And that mountaintop for you, for you, for me, might be very different kinds of mountaintops. It might be when you go outside and it's zero degrees and it's the middle of the night and you look up at the dark blue sky and there are a million stars peering down at you. Or your mountaintop may be your sewing room with fabric or stacks of fabric all around you like old friends. Or maybe your mountaintop is an old barn with pigeons in the rafters and the smell of an old tractor and its snow blade. I think we all need those places to have where we can encounter God in some way where we have that awe-filled feeling of the divine. In our scripture today, what do mountains do? What do mountains do? First of all, mountains, mountaintops, help us to get away. In our scripture today, Jesus, we read that Jesus took Peter, James, and John 
with him up to the top of a very high mountain. And there they were all alone. There they were all alone. Mountains help us get away. And we need that as human beings so that we can expand our horizons. And, and they might be in our everyday lives. I've got a friend who is about my age, and he's been through a lot in life. And he's kept himself in shape, and he's really engaged with life. But there are times when he says that everything seems random. There are days like that. Do you ever have a day like that where everything just seems random and nothing seems to fit? And he says that if he remembers to, in his words, get quiet, if he remembers to get quiet, then he begins to see God in everyone and God in everything. It's his form of a mountaintop. You know, as human beings, we make time for exercise in our lives, right? We make time for far-flung family, extended family, for friends. You got to make time for things that are important. And so we need to make time for God in our lives. I'm reminded of back when our daughter Caitlin was a teenager. She was a 16 year old and she was getting ready for her behind the wheel test. And I, I remember the night before her behind the wheel test, I took her for one last practice drive. And, and one of the things we of course did was practice parallel parking. And so I got out of the car and I, I pretended that I was the car behind the parking space that she was going to back into. And we didn't have the exact dimensions of a parking space. And so it was, we, we kind of figured it out and, and she did okay. It was tight, but she did okay. And I didn't get bumped at all. The next morning, I took her to the behind-the-wheel test, and she said that when she got to the part for the parallel parking, she noticed that the poles were set up wider than they were the night before when she and I practiced. And it was a cinch for her. I think that's what mountaintops do for us. They expand our horizons. They expand our ability to just be in touch with God, to reflect on our lives, to reflect on our world. They expand it. Mountaintops help us get away. No matter what their elevation, whatever their location, whether they be in the everyday or whether they be in extraordinary times of our lives. They help us get away. All right, second. Mountains help us to encounter light. They help us to encounter light. As Jesus was taking Peter, James, and John up the mountain, He was transfigured before them, we read. And His clothes became amazingly bright. You know, this story in our scripture is set at the midpoint of Mark's gospel. And there's significance to that because it's midpoint in the journey. From the very start of Mark's gospel with the start of Jesus' public ministry, all the way to the crucifixion and the empty tomb, it's set at the midpoint of that. Is there light along the journey for you and me? Is there light that we're moving toward on this journey that we're on? You know, if there is no grand narrative that we are living our lives by, if there's no grand story of Scripture that we're living our lives by, if Genesis 1 and 2 where it says God created the heavens and the earth means nothing, if we aren't looking toward that day when the swords are going to be beaten into plowshares, if we aren't looking toward that day when God is going to wipe away every tear from our eyes, if we are not looking toward that day when justice will be done, that day when, yes, eternal life 
is true for every moment and forever, if there's no such thing as justice, if there's no such thing as eternal life, if everything is random and meaningless, then we might as well get used to grieving because that's all there is. Is there light along the journey? Is there light that we are moving toward? The transfiguration story says yes. Yes, a thousand times yes. We are people of resurrection. And you know, folks, you and I get the chance to be part of Christ's light for other people. Inside the church, where it's just as important as outside the church. Outside the church, where it's just as important as inside the church. We get the chance to be part of Christ's light for others. I've got permission to share this story. A couple of, of our active members, Jack and Vicki Griffin. You heard Jack talk just a moment ago about Holy Hammers. They recently returned from a couple of weeks in Florida. I know, think palm trees and think blue skies, think warm temperatures, think sun. But as good United Methodists, they went to worship at United Methodist churches while they were down in Florida. And at one of those churches, they said that they just had gotten out of their car and all sorts of people started greeting them. And they were halfway to the sanctuary and they estimate, I hope I'm telling this story right, that maybe they walked past 15 people and 13 of those 15 people went out of their way to welcome them. And someone saw them and said, oh, you have to come to our snowbirds gathering. So you know what to expect. How did they know that Jack and Vicki were snowbirds? You know, how, how do they know that Minnesotans in February uh, are not Floridians? But anyway, someone saw Jack and Vicki and, and said, you've got to come to our snowbirds gathering. So you know what to expect at our church. And so they went and they were having a cup of coffee and they were hearing about the church and what the church did on Sunday mornings. And, and uh, the various hosts were saying, hey, Vicki, you've got to meet Sarah. And, and Jack, you've got to meet Joe. And as this went on, Jack and Vicki asked, isn't it about time for the service to start? We need to get into the sanctuary. And the host said, that can wait. This is more important. We'll get into the service, but this is more important. You see, we're making family here right now, and we'll make more family later in the service. We're making family here now, and we're making more family in the service. And I dare say Jack and Vicky felt like a million dollars after that. How can you and I be a part of Christ's light to others inside the church and outside the church? Mountaintops help us encounter light. All right, so third today. Mountains are memory sites. They're memory sites. The ancient peoples of the Middle East saw mountains, often surrounded by flatlands, saw mountains as places where their sacred stories that reached way back, places where their sacred stories became palpable to them, become, became very real to them. And so contemporary scholars call these memory sites... We read that when Jesus was transfigured before Peter, James, and John, that they saw Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus, wellsprings of their deep Jewish faith. It was a memory site for them. Who are the holy people that have put you in touch with God's grace? Who are the holy people who have put you in touch with what it is to be most deeply yourself? To be your best self as created in the image of God. I'm not talking about plaster saints. I'm not talking about people who are Teflon 
coated and they breeze so easily through life. I'm not talking about holier than thou people. I'm not talking about perfect people. I'm talking about those real people, those authentic people, those people who, who have their hearts aligned with what they say and do. Who are those people in your life? And how do you stay in touch with them in your life and in your memory? What are the memory sites for you? Back, oh, it was, it was a while ago, certainly. I woke up in the m- middle of the night, which I often do, and, and the pastorate, there's always something going on. Uh, there's always a list of things that you're thinking about, and, and uh, like the work that, that many of you do. And so I, I got up in the middle of the night uh, and uh, started writing down a couple of things that, that uh, were on my mind, and it's, it's always a good time for some light reading, not heavy reading, but light reading, and often for prayer and reflection. Well, that night I didn't spend uh, too much time uh, down in the living room, and I, I came back to bed and got back to sleep. And I dreamt of the men on my dad's side of the family. My grandfather, my great uncle, his son, two of my uncles. And these were men who were smiling at me in the dream. And these are men that I worked beside as I was growing up. We would bale hay every month at the five farms that, that our extended family had. And so that I knew they could be deadly serious. They didn't mess around when it came to safety issues, when it came to, to making a living. And yet, more often than not, I remember them smiling. I come, I realize, from this line of men in my life, as well as women in my life, who are strong, who were encouragers. And I woke up from that dream and I got right back to sleep because I felt comforted and strengthened deep within my heart. It was a memory sight for me. Not that I asked for it, not that I expected this by any means, but for you, how is it that perhaps when you least expect it, perhaps times when you do expect it, that you are in touch with those who have had a holy effect on your life to be that loving person, to be that just person, to be that person in intimate relationship with God. There is light. There is light. Amen and amen.